I'd now like to recognize uh, Ali Reed from Holy Child School to uh, make our introductions. It is my pleasure to now introduce three Marine veterans from the pitched battle of Iwo Jima from the Pacific Campaign of World War II, characterized by some of the fiercest fighting in the war efforts. Donald Mates, of the veteran, of, a veteran of the 3rd Marine Division, Chuck Tatum, recipient of the Bronze Star and author of the legendary book Iwo Jima, Red Blood, Black Sand, and consultant for the upcoming HBO miniseries The Pacific, produced by Tom Hanks and Steven Spielberg, and James White, also a veteran of the 3rd Marine Division whose experience of hand-to-hand -hand combat on the island of Iwo Jima was featured in an article by men of the 442nd RCT March Through France in the Leather Le Leatherneck Magazine. Please join me in now welcoming Donald Mates, Chuck Tatum, and James White. Hello, I'm uh, Chuck Tatum, and I was a member of B Company 1st Battalion of the 27th Marines at Iwo Jima. And as I look in the audience, I see an awful lot of young people here. Some of them doesn't look any older than I was when I was at Iwo Jima. Anybody here 18 years of age? Young, younger, huh? Well, a lot of people haven't heard of Iwo Jima. It's been 60 some years since it happened, and all histor historical events fade in the past. But on, sometimes during the year we recognize what happened at Iwo Jima. And why, why was there an Iwo Jima? Heck, it's just eight square miles of volcanic rock out in the middle of the ocean. And its only value was it was big enough to build a landing strip to land a B-29 on. And if you had a B place to land B-29s, you could fly all the way to Tokyo and bomb it with the big bombers. Uh, I don't know how many of us invaded that first day, but I think the first wave, there was 9,000 Marines involved in it. And its importance was we had captured the islands of Iwo Subhan and Tinian, and from there you could fly the B-29s and bomb Tokyo. But there was one flaw in the whole plan. Iwo Jima was halfway between Saipan, Tinian, and Tokyo. 600 miles from Tokyo. And on Iwo Jima they had fighter planes that could rise up to fight the B-29s. And they also had radar there. They could not uh, tell Japan that the B-29s were coming. And the losses of the B-29s were astronomical. They were losing more than 30% per flight. So somehow or another, Iwo Jima became the most valuable piece of real estate in the world at that time, equally valuable to Japan and America. And the orders came out from Washington to capture Iwo Jima by force of arms. And this meant sending in the United States Marines. Uh, the Marines have fought in a lot of battles already, but Iwo Jima was to turn out to be one of their greatest battles in history. Uh, Iwo Jima was more than just a battle. It was, a, it was actually a 36-day descent into hell, hell on earth, because that's what it was. And uh, we lost 8,776 American lives. There was 21,000 Americans wounded 1,500 suffered from combat fatigue, and 22,000 Japanese Imperial soldiers and sailors lost their lives defending Iwo Jima. So it became a very pivotal battle in the Pacific. And with Iwo Jima in our hands, we were in control of the bombing of Tokyo, which ultimately culminated in the B-29 that dropped the bomb. And that's why they had to have Iwo Jima. Other than that, it was eight miles of worthless sulfur volcanic ash. My personal experience there happened on the morning of February 19, 1945. And we landed in the first wave. And immediately we started climbing these sand terraces you might have seen in pictures. And I was on the second or third terrace. And when I looked back at the beach, I could see one solitary Marine standing up walking. And this was Marine Gunnery Sergeant John Bassalone, the Medal of Honor recipient at Guadalcanal. 
he could see that the invasion had kind of gone ground to a halt. So he was motivating everybody by cuss words and kicks in the seats of the pants to get everybody underway. Well, my position was about three or four terraces up, and I was a machine gunner, and when Bassalone came to my position, he pointed out a target, and by looking down his arm, I could see the aperture of this giant Japanese pillbox. And he indicated I should start firing on it. Well, as soon as I pulled the trigger, the gun didn't fire. It had been fouled by the black sands of Iwo Jima. So at that point, my assistant gunner has to take the toothbrush out of my pack and clean the breech and blow the sand out of it. He sticks the belt back in, and we start firing, and I could see the tracers hitting close to the pillbox. And Bessalone didn't like that, so he indicated I should move obliquely to my right and fire at it, which we did. And, but then the, they closed the steel doors, and the bullets were just bouncing off of it. And uh, he, he finds a, a demolition man, a guy that does the explosives. And this demolition man, as I'm firing at the pillbox, he walks up the line of fire. When he gets within about 10 feet of it, he tosses the composition C2, about 10 pounds of it. And it blew this thing all to heck, blew the doors off of it. At that point, Bassalone indicated I should commence firing. And I did into the aperture. And at this time, he finds a flamethrower man. And the flamethrower man walked up the line of fire. And when he gets almost there, Bassalone whacks me on the helmet to quit firing. And he advances the last few feet and shoots three bursts of napalm into the Japanese pillbox. You know, that turned it into an inferno right there. It looked like a in, beginning of hell or something. But not knowing anything about the battle, Barcelona did. He reached down, and he unhooked the, the machine gun from the pinnel hook, and he grabbed it and his arms with the belt in it, and he screamed in my arm, get the belt, in my ear, get the belt. So I got the belt, and he ran up the back of this, in front of this pillbox, looking over the back where they had entered. And out the back of it comes seven or eight Japanese defenders on fire, napalm all over them. And Bassalone mows them down, shooting his machine gun from the hip, and they all fall dead there. And later on I thought, well, that was probably a mercy killing because those men were already dead. At that point, he hands me back my machine gun, and he gives the signal to follow me. And 18 or 19 of us follow Bass alone from the beach across the lowlands uh, area there where the scrub brush, and we go up on the airstrip, number one airstrip. But well, it hoped to catch the airstrip sometime that day, but we're on there at 10 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and now then we're re receiving fire from Suribachi, from the mortars at the other end of the island, at the other end of the airstrip, and worst of all, we're receiving fire from the United States Navy. We're, we're too far advanced, and they're putting the rolling barrage over us. Well, I thought we should have got out of there, really. Pull a retrograde movement. <laughs> Go back. Bassalone stopped that. He said, you're staying here, come hell or high water. I'm going to back and get more Marines, and we're going to fight our way across this island. And he left us there, and he went back to the beach. Now, I couldn't tell you in real time how long he was gone, because when you're in combat, there's no recognition of time. And pretty soon, we look over there where we came from, and Bassalone's leading a group of Marines across the same way we'd come there, and he's coming to the airstrip. And all of a sudden, you could hear the shrill sound of incoming mortar rounds. And you could see the mortar lit right amidst Barcelona and Sea Company Marines. <laughs>